So first of all, just thank you for coming out and spending your Saturday evening with us. Um, we are absolutely thrilled to be on the opening, uh, the public opening evening of An Atlas of Es Dublin, which is the first monographic show of British artist and designer Es Dublin. Um, and we really are in for an incredible treat tonight. I mean, as Maria had mentioned, as and I have been in conversation for over five years at this point. This is our first public conversation. Uh, and everything has been made manifest in the book, which we are thrilled as is here to sign for all of you this evening. Oh, did I just lose that? Moment? Going in and out. But really one of the things that I wanted to do with the show upstairs is to bring to general audiences as his work, to make people aware of everything that she does. Because I think so many of us are, thank you. Let's try this. I think so many of us are aware of as his work without even realizing who it was that creates this. We've probably all seen so many of the pop concert, the stadium tours, the Olympic ceremonies that she has designed for, the theater shows, the opera shows, the NFL Super Bowl halftime show. You know, but really what she's doing is applying her art to bring people together, whether that's in an intimate theatrical setting or in a vast stadium venue. And she's doing that to form what she calls temporary societies, united through the experiences that she creates. I mean, she really is one of the most influential designers of our time, and Donatien Grau, who's the head of programs uh, at the Louvre, called as a Renaissance woman in his opening essay in the book, and I could not agree more. So the show upstairs, of course, is a survey of her work over the past 30 years. We have hundreds upon hundreds of the sketches and drawings and paintings and models, um, all that form the seeds of some of the most memorable cultural congregations of music um, and art and activism from our recent times. And of course, all of this coincides with the publication of the book. So tonight we're gonna touch on Ez's extraordinary creative work, her process and her practice, and of course, on our making of the book and the exhibition. And we'll have time for a Q&A at the end, so be thinking of some questions then that you can ask as. And I think we will all surely come away with a bit of a shift in perspective. Pharrell Williams in the book said about as that when you meet with her, with her perspective, she literally turns things around. Ez is a walking turning point for anyone she interacts with. And so it's an incredibly special evening that we are able to have that time here with you tonight. So, Ez, I want to first start out, ask you a question. I know you're always asked, but everyone is always curious to know, how did you get started? How did all of this start? Well, before I answer the question, which you know I will, um, firstly, I just want to welcome everyone and thank you, because we have talked before, but we've not done a talk in front of an audience who are the public. We did a talk at MoMA, but it was invited audience. So thank you so much for buying a ticket. Um, thank you for being interested enough to turn up. It's really, really lovely. And you are a really special audience to me because it's one thing to invite people, but to have people who bought a ticket to come is really special. So thank you for coming on the first day of the show. Thank you for buying tickets for this event a while ago. It means a lot. Um, in answer to your question, um, how did it start? So, um, I guess I was one of those children at school who, from, from the age of around six, I guess, um, I think from what my understanding of neuroscience is, which is very popular science in, in, and not profound, but I understand that around six years old is when a child's mind starts to coalesce, the wiring in it starts to converge, I think, from what I've read. And what I was doing when I was six was a number of things. I was, I just moved from the suburbs of London where I grew up uh, with one of four children, and I had just moved to the seaside, to a small town. And I guess it was a very particular time, um, the end of the 1970s. It was a time in Britain where 
there was a kind of socialist hope, I guess, of the good life of moving out of the city to the countryside. My parents planted a garden, hoped we would be self-sufficient. I think it all, anyway, we won't talk any further about that. But um, so it, it was a hopeful time when I was six, I guess. And we, we moved to a house that was much bigger than we would have had in London or in the suburbs. And there was room for us to have a little sort of theatrical space. It was tiny, it was literally like the Harry Potter space where he lived underneath the stairs. It was that cupboard. But to us, it was huge because it was ours and we could shut a little curtain. And we had one of those things, like you, there's actually a post of it in the corridor up there, a little viewfinder thing that you could click with little circular um, slides. And we would click through that and sort of enter different worlds. We would set up a little light bulb, do little shadow plays. We had toy theaters and we would just make our own world. There wasn't much to do at the end of the 70s. There was not much telly. The TV didn't start. There was only three channels and it didn't start till 4 p.m. So, and there wasn't much money for us. So it was make things out of cardboard boxes under the stairs. Another strange thing happened in that next to my house was a model of our town, a little scale model. And I think in my brain, when I looked, what happened with this scale model is they did a little sonne lumiere. So every house in the model told a story. There was a little voice coming out of the model houses. And because I was young, and this is all I knew, I thought that houses spoke. I genuinely thought it. And I think also something happens when you look at a scale model, and there's a reason why we all like them, is because we are able to consider ourselves at two perspectives at once. We consider ourselves tiny, and this thing is giant, and we consider ourselves big, and this thing is small and somehow understandable, and there's a calming sort of aspect in that, a comfort, I think, in thinking you can see a system while also seeing your own part in the system. And I think at some level I was getting that, and I thought I was at once in my house and that my house could talk. And then there was another thing in that the person who had lived in my house before had written a book about ghosts in the house that told stories. So there were all sorts of things converging. And then, what was the question again? Oh yeah, how did I start? So yeah, that, that happened. And then when I was at school, I liked doing lots of different things. I liked to play musical instruments. I was super hard working on my music. Wasn't particularly good, but I worked hard. And I liked drawing, and I liked reading. And in the end, by the time, we'll do a, this could take a while. So by the time I got to the end of my studies, um, really what the teacher said to me is, you must work in the theater. There is nowhere else where you will find this convergence. I didn't think the theatre was very interesting. I had seen pantomimes and Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, but that was it. So I wasn't a big lover and I didn't really get it. But when I went and met the people on the theatre design course, I liked the room, I liked the smell of the room, I liked the people, I liked what they were doing, I liked their little cardboard models. I liked the conviviality, the communality of it. And then they started taking me to good theatre, really good theatre. And by now we're in the 80s and the British art scene has taken off. It's all about how much money the art is worth. The 80s are happening. Margaret Thatcher is saying there's no such thing as society, only the individual. And I'm not thinking consciously about this, but something in me is saying making communal work for a collective audience feels right to me. So that's the story. So, well, up to a point. Yeah. Well, and, and this is the thing is, you know, there really very clearly is this urge and this impulse in your work to connect and to communicate and to share. I mean, you are an artist, but you apply your art in the collective. And that's what's so fascinating. I mean, you know, tell us a bit more then about, you know, your early transitions then into some of those early theaters, Almeida Theater, the Bush Theater, and then how you began to transition into larger theaters, European opera. So something was happening in the mid-90s when I started, I just finished my course and I started in little theaters, you know, tiny theaters, 75 audience, little rooms, no bigger than this room probably. The stage, not much bigger than this stage we're standing on actually at the Bush Theater. And yet the plays were big. And the reason the plays were big was because, again, as a result of 20 years of Thatcher's lack of investment in the arts in Britain, uh, there was no investment in the British film industry. We used to see French films, there was a lot of new French films, but not British, not 
you know, unless they were not, not a young independent scene, there just wasn't. So a lot of young writers who wanted to write a film would instead write a play, because they knew they could get it put on cheaply, but they would write it like a film. So it had like 64 scenes, and we're on a stage this big. So the really good thing about that was there wasn't an option to slide bedrooms on and off. That wasn't gonna happen. So the craft of finding the essence of a text and expressing the essence of what's important and what you need to communicate to a, a gathering of 75 people, that wasn't a choice so much as a necessity. And that's really where I guess I honed my craft of trying to find the essence of a text. Uh, in those small theatres, and then that led to bigger theatres, and then to opera, and from there to pop music. You know, and give us a glimpse into that transition into pop music. How did that happen? And is that approach any different than what you were doing already for theatre and opera? So, how it happened was um, from an opera um, project, I was invited to do uh, a very you know, a one night only pop project. It's upstairs, it's called Wire. Um, it's a band called Wire. And um, I had been going out with a record producer, sound engineer, so I'd been to a lot of gigs. And I'd always seen this kind of, you know, he liked guitar bands. So I'd always seen these kind of four men, one man sitting up on a little podium, the rest sort of with their gear, lots of cables, and I just thought it was a bit messy. And I wanted to tidy it up. I was like, I'll tidy this up for you. I don't know anything about music, rock and roll, but I'll tidy it up. So I drew a little square around each one, put them each in a box. And I, I also, because I had been so used to, from three years studying English literature, I forgot to mention that bit, um, I had been so used to having to be rigorous. And I couldn't get away with just saying, it will be so. There had to be you know, a justification for it. So. I needed a hook. I couldn't just do a design. I'm, I'm, I'm really crap at decorating. Like if you asked me to do your wedding, I, would, I don't know where to start. I'd have to like go into what's the story, what's the narrative? You know, <laughs> when are you getting divorced? I was like, I don't know. But so so I, I, I needed a hook. So I thought, well, what if I treat this as a portrait of the band? Um, so I filmed one band member's ear for the whole show, one band member's nose, one mouth and one eye. Then I also rigged them all up to ECG heart reading machines. So we had their heartbeat going all the way through. And I slightly faked the MRI scan because it was too expensive, but it looked like there was an MRI scan at the back. So it was a sort of composite portrait of this band. And that for me, then I understood what I was doing and I could see a, a meaning and a, a worth in doing it. So that's how it began. And then Kanye saw that show in a picture, because my friend happened to be in a room near him when he heard him firing somebody. So that's how I ended up doing <laughs> Touch, the, Touch, Touch the Sky tour, which was his college tour in 2004. So that was the beginning of a decade of collaboration. And I do just have to ask, circling back to your Wire performance, at the end of the show, when the band I really want me to humiliate myself. I really, myself. yeah. Um, so I haven't seen Spinal Tap. Apparently it's a film about <laughs> pop gone wrong and all that. I, I refuse to see it. Um, um, but apparently it is a film about sort of comedy, you know, failures to do set design for pop shows. So I, I'm not gonna see it. But um, what I did do, which people have told me is similar, is this was a very, very low budget, this first pop concert. It was probably, I think I had 3,000 pounds to make these four big boxes. And even though it was a while ago, that still wasn't enough money. And I, had to, I wanted mirror on the inside. I think I just put tin foil in the end. I couldn't get mirror. Um, and I put these BP screens on the back. I needed to get four projectors. It was quite ambitious. And when it came to getting Velcro so that I could you know, take these scrims off the front, that was beyond the budget. But I think the Velcro was gonna be 150 pounds. I didn't have. So I just said, never mind, we'll staple them in. So once the band were in, I just went around and stapled them in. And I didn't really consider how they were going to get out. <laughs> and I hadn't realised it was their farewell performance. And these were all their fans at the Barbican Hall, all coming out to see their last glimpse of their great heroes. So at the end, of course, they were... <laughs> but, but, yeah. 
There wasn't really a front curtain either, so they just had to stay in there till the audience left. I also found out later that the band absolutely hated each other. So they were quite happy to be in separate boxes. But it was impossible for them to play. I did find that out later, so they just completely played it off track. So anyway, apart from them not being able to play and hating each other, not being able to get out, it was a really <laughs> excellent design. But it looks good. You know, and, and I, that's what's so interesting, though, is, is, you know, you stay so true to the narrative, or you really dig in to find a story, even in a pop concert. You know, so how did you then continue to do that for, on these bigger stages and with bigger artists? What do you look to to find the narrative? Yeah, I think I'm just really intolerant of things that don't mean something. I just think, like, I've always thought that life's a bit too short. You know, there's this book, actually, that um, Ros Sulkas recommended to me called 4,000 Weeks. Why do you think, does anyone know in the audience why a book would be called 4,000 Weeks? Has anyone read it? Someone just said it. Yeah, that's how long we live, apparently. Sorry to put it down on the evening. <laughs> Cheerful question. Let's talk about pop stars. <laughs> anyway, um, I, yeah, I just, I have always felt that. I guess I've always felt the urgency of anything. I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a diligent person. I'm quite a, I'm quite a sort of, I'm a sort of person in, at school who was like that at the front of the class and no one liked me because so I was just like the little swat. But I, I just, I'm an enthusiast and I'm curious and I'm quite, I'm quite determined to make every single beat of my life count. Even if it's just me humbly drawing a bird. I, I will give my whole self to it. And I just can't live in any other way, because I do, the older I get also, I, I do feel that we are incredibly lucky to have been born. <laughs> I think you could be born in all sorts of places and ways, and, or not, not be born. And I just think on this planet, I see it as an immense privilege. And I, I think, not consciously, but I've always had a sense of that. So the idea for me of messing around with you know, just some decoration, or should we just put some lights up there? I can't do it. It's not that I, it's not that I don't, I actually can't. I don't know where to start, I just, I make really crap work when I can't find a meaning. So that's what I've done throughout. And, and actually with any lyric, um, you can find something. My, my, my studio used to laugh at me because with Take That, they had a song called I Want You Back, I Want You Back, I Want You Back for Good. And I'd be sitting there like underlining it, you know, and they're like, how can you find, how can you annotate that? I was like, I can find, you know, find in anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a mantra in everything. There's always a reason why somebody bothered to write that down. There's always a context. So I've just carried on the same as I used to do when I was studying English literature. I've just carried on the same every time. Um, just gonna give her a glass of water. Well, you know, and that's what I love even, and we see this upstairs, is the annotated set list. I mean, you are treating these pop lyrics as primary texts, because they are. <laughs> they are, but the, I have to say to you, those set lists, as you know, are, are there, there's a quite a funny story as to why they're annotated. The, the lyric sheets are annotated because I'm trying to find a way through, make a map, find really an overlap between my lines of inquiry and the artist's lines of inquiry. Um, and there always is one somewhere. You know, we're all humans, there's always an overlap if you look hard enough for it. Um, the set lists, often we're draw doing little drawings on set lists simply because I had been used to a rehearsal process, a technical rehearsal process in a theatre. How many people in here work in theatre? Is anyone a theatre designer? Okay, so you know what it, how it is in the tech. You know, it's quite orderly most of the time. You know, we start the technical rehearsal, we you know, program our lights, the actors say their piece, we put the light on them, we put the video on them, if there is some, we bring a prop on it. You stitch it together slowly, and that's how you build it up. Um, in rock and roll, it's not like that. It's just playing, and it's really loud. <laughs> so you can't quietly say, oh, should we move this to the right? Like, you cannot hear each other. You're mainly wearing, well, I wish I'd been wearing earplugs, and I wouldn't be so deaf now. <laughs> People kept saying to me, do you want earplugs? I was like, no. And now I'm really quite deaf. But anyway, and blind. Should have worn the glasses and earplugs the whole time. But um, so, so a lot of those annotations on the set list that you see upstairs is literally me talking to the video designer or the light designer going like that and showing it or writing notes as we go through the show. So that's really what they are, me watching the rehearsal and making little notes because you cannot talk. 
and it all happens. It's not stop, stop start. Um, yeah, they just go, and you have to quickly catch up. It's very, very different vibe. Well, and then all of a sudden in 2012, you're doing the London Olympic ceremonies, the closing ceremonies, and um, and you're doing, again, continuing to do larger scale works. And it just seems like there begins to be this velocity <laughs> to your practice itself. And so, you know, what, what kind of began? Give us a glimpse into that period. Well, London 2012 was interesting. Um, I see that as quite a turning point in, 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 well, it was for us in London, actually, because, you know, we'd had a big turning point in 1997 when 20 years of the Conservative government ended. And it was a period of great hope for us. Um, when the new Labour government came in, we really thought there was a big shift, and in many ways there was. Um, a load more investment in the arts. I was able to open the new, in 1998, we opened the new um, South as Wales building. I mean, sure enough, it had obviously been planned before that. But it felt like the Tate Modern then opened. It felt like there was a real movement towards investment in arts. Uh, a new cultural spirit in London. It, it felt really hopeful, actually. And um, then, of course, Princess Diana died same year, um, which was extraordinary because Britain, London, well, the whole country behaved almost like a Catholic country. When you walked through Kensington Gardens, there were candles all over the, the grass. There were little, you know, bunches of flowers. And that's not the way English people historically had behaved, in my experience. It was very unusual. It was a big outpouring. So it was quite a specific time. And then, you know, the 90s went on, um, and then, you know, we get into the 2000s. Here we are then in 2010 with the Conservative government. And 2012 was a bit of a, people all thought it was gonna be a disaster. You know, all the cab drivers said, oh, there'll be traffic jams, it's gonna be rubbish, it's gonna rain, oh, it'll be over budget, it'll be terrible. It was a bit of a British, you know, no one will be able to get it, it's all gonna be terrible. And actually, my first design for the closing ceremony was, I thought I would kind of second guess it being bad weather. So I made this whole cloth to cover the entire stadium in big gray clouds. In fact, in the event, we had so little time to set that shot, we didn't get it on. So we just put down this big, well, really, I'd have to tell you what, what I was asked to do for that one, because it was quite unusual. Having sort of worked with character a lot, this was an invitation to express the character of a country and of a city. And I was given a very express direction by the British government that it had to be, or by the, you know, by the director, really, in fairness, but it had been approved by the government. And they wanted it to be a big Union Jack flag. And I thought it was a really terrible idea <laughs> because it's meant to be Olympic in spirit. It's not meant to be you know, about the country. All of the athletes from 200 countries are gonna be on there. So I said, no, let's not do that. But I, you know, people often ask me, what happens when you, know, you have to design something you don't wanna do? And this is a really, interesting example of it, I think, because I, 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 the choice was either don't do the project or make a go of this flag. So I did what I historically do when I'm quite, quite stuck, and I was quite depressed about it, and I thought, okay, well, let me research this flag. See if I can, I, I have, I've always had a bad feeling about this flag, but I'm gonna research it, see if I can find anything redeeming in its history. So I went back, um, this was quite early days of the internet, you know, in 2011, if you, Googled Union Jack art, you found cushions, you found Jerry Halliwell's dress from the, from the Spice Girls, and you did find uh, the Sex Pistols torn up God Save the Queen cover. I thought, well, that's got some energy, but I can't really put that on the Olympics. That might not go down so well. She wants some water, some water. Um, I think we might need some more glasses up here. It's quite dry. Um, so, I researched that and then I found um, an article about the origins of the flag. So James I, back in the 1600s, had some graphic designers design the UK flag when he was busy poaching Scotland um, and combining the George Cross, the red cru cruciform structure, and the um, St Andrew's crisscross in blue. So you can see in the history of the flag history of colonization, it was just like a, I'll have, it was a stamp on top. And then, you know, when the British government in the 1800s then nicked Northern Ireland, it was just, a, you know, the Patricks was shoved in there as well. So the his, I, knew, I then realized why I never really liked it. But when I was growing up, the only time you saw the Union Jack flag was either on a skinhead's 
fascist forehead tattooed, the National Front, you know, anti-immigration, racist, skinhead people, or it was um, older people who were waving flags at tea parties and had an old sense of empire. But no one my age would have ever gone near that flag. We felt weird about it. And then I understood why. When I looked at this history, I thought, that, that's why I don't like it. So I thought, how can I get the energy of that Sex Pistols, expl you know, torn up safety pin flag and still be celebratory and celebrate the fact that we're doing the Olympics? So I saw, I had worked with Damien Hurst years ago as an intern, and his spin paintings were just out then. So I went to his studio and, and said to his team, I actually didn't get an audience with him at the time, and I said to his team, would, would we be able to take this spin painting colour it red, white, and blue, and turn it into a flag. So it has that centrifugal champagne cork popping, but also anarchic you know, expansion celebratory bursting apart at the seams. Then I felt comfortable with the flag. And then all the cruciform bits that were meant to be white, I printed newsprint with uh, text from 3,000 words of British poetry, which no one actually saw, but it took a long time to clear. Anyway, um, <laughs> and then on the day of setting it up, we were running around, you only have 16 hours, and I was setting all these pieces out, and the, the eighth one was missing. So at, literally, the cameras are rolling, I'm looking in the top shot, there's this beautiful shot, it's looking amazing, but it's like a pizza with one bit green with the grass. And, this, and, and all, everyone's mobile phones have run out, we're running around this stadium trying to find the last bit of this bloody flag. And some, and some health and safety checkers had put it in the bin, because they were worried that an athlete might trip on it. Anyway, so... But you got it in in time? That was, that was the Olympics. Yeah. yeah, actually what happened there, just another, just to finish the story, I know we've gone on a bit about this, but for anyone who works in anything, about how to, how to use what you have. In that moment, I had health and safety people saying, we're going to take all of it away. So I went to the mass movement guy, and I said, I haven't got staples to staple this whole thing down, nor have I got time. I said, can you turn your mass cast into human staples? Can they stand like this? Because he had them all, it was like the Truman Show. When you do a mass cast thing, they all have their little in-ears. And I thought, that was the only thing I can mobilize is people. And I just begged him, I think I was weeping. And bleed. my hands were bleeding, I was just weeping. I was like, please. And they could see it look great. It wasn't just me begging, the thing itself was begging to be completed. You could see it on the screen, you could see it was gonna be good. So he ran around and planted his people. Anyway, each wow. show's like that. Let's wow. just walk. <laughs> I no wonder I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and actually, and I have to ask, too, I mean, for all of this work you do, how do you maintain the stamina? It's absolutely incredible. You're just prolific. How do you do it? I think it's, there's a few things. Um, I, I think people, I think I'm, I draw the energy from people around me. I really am buoyed up by my studio team, the teams, like even making this, the show upstairs, or you could see me just kind of going <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I've just learned you don't have to do anything on your own. And actually people love it when you come to them and say, I'm completely stuck, please help. It's a really generous thing to do to, to go and say, please help me. Um, so I've learned that, and I do very little on my own. That's why, because when you say stamina, I don't, Actually, it's all, everything is done with friends. Even that day at the Olympics, I rang everybody. All my friends came. We had like five set designers. They all, because it was only set designers who had the um, badge, the uh, accreditation who were allowed on site at that point. But they all, the designer of the opening ceremony, of the Paralympic ceremony, we were meant to sort of be in competition. There was no competition. We were all colleagues. They all came. They all helped me. So I don't do anything on my own. I'm always helped. I'm always part of the team. And I think we feel that even as an audience. You know, you said that audiences are like a temporary society, a rehearsal community. So can you talk about the role that the audience even plays in your work? Yeah, I think, I think something really happen, interesting happens when human beings gather together. And I think, you know, there's been much written about it that sort of the optimum gathering is 150 people, which is what we have about here, I think. Um, and... I think different sizes of groups of people have different characteristics. And I've learned about them because I've spent time with groups of 75 people in small theatres. I've spent time with groups of, you know, 1,000 people in larger theatres and time with groups of 100,000 people in stadia. 
And each has a different quality. Each, I would say, is like a different species. So I see the audience as a really intelligent beast, a combined mind. And I felt that, as we all have, everyone sitting here has felt it, you're feeling it now, but when something is actually happening in an interaction between humans conducting energy with other humans in this type of arrangement, um, I mean, I've quoted this a few times this week, so I, in, at the risk of boring you, I'll say it again, if you've heard me say this before, um, in the book, there's an interview with Lindsay Turner, who's a fantastic uh, director, a theatre director, and she said something so beautiful. She's, she said, the thing about theatre is the actors agree to pretend that the audience aren't there. The audience agree to pretend that they're not there. And we all agree to do this at 7.30. And we still the ego for the greater good. And when she said that, Oh, that's what we're doing. Um, but also, when you sit in an audience and you can hear everybody getting it at once, it's like a continuation of mind. Um, and it's, I do believe it's a rehearsal for how we could be, you know, um, in many ways, you know. And I, I, I think also collaboration is a rehearsal for how we could be. You know, I often find I use all my powers of empathy and trying to see through someone else's eyes when I'm working. And then I observe that when I walk into a security situation, someone's searching my bag, I don't even look at the person. So I've really taken myself in hand lately, over the last five years, I guess. And you, you know, I make a real point of trying to, trying to subtract any situation which has been industrialized. Any situation in which the terms of engagement between myself and another human being are not operating as two humans or multiple humans, but are operating as part of an industrialized, hierarchized system. And you realize that these systems weren't always there. Um, and I think, actually, when we're queuing and having searches done or something, that's quite an acute version, because it's perhaps some of the most mechanized, industrialized, dehumanized situations we find ourselves in. And I used to get frustrated and anxious about it, and then I turned it around for myself by saying, well, what if I try to behave you know, really consciously in a way that takes away that hierarchical, industrialized terms of engagement from any situation ever. It just shouldn't ever be there. And, and I think that's a practice that is worth looking, all of us looking at more, um, especially as city dwellers, because we spend so much time. There's a film upstairs in the penultimate room. Um, it's from a piece called Room 2022, and it was me sort of looking at a hotel as a kind of model for a society and looking at the ways we strenuously unimagine things in a hotel. I mean, I did it, I found myself doing it today. I've tried to stop doing it, but I was in a rush to get out and I left a mess in my room and I really try not to because by leaving a mess in your room, you're unimagining the person's got to clean your shit up. So I really try and not do that. But um, sometimes I, you know, I, I do. But but I think, yeah, we, we are in cities, especially in London, I'm, unimagining the person who's asking for money on the street, you know, and I tr I'm trying to unpick those dehumanized situations, and I think my life is so much better since I've done it. I mean, there's such a generosity of spirit in that. So this idea around the ritual of gathering, how does that play into the exhibition upstairs? You did the exhibition design, of course. So what did you really want audiences to feel after that? first studio room and experience? Well, I'll tell you the, the sort of etymology of that first room. So when I was, 1993, I was studying theatre design, I would have been in my early 20s, and Felix Barrett, many of you might know a company called Punch Drunk, a wonderful theatre company, he was at school, he's a couple of years younger than me, so he was just finishing school, and his teacher took him to an installation called HG, about HG Wells, by Robert Wilson, who's a great theatre maker and by Hans-Peter Kuhn, who's an amazing German uh, sound, sound designer. I went, we, me and Felix didn't know each other, but we both went. And the way that piece started was everybody walked into a room. The room was probably, I don't know, about half the size of this room. And it had a big dining table in it, set with steam coming off the peas and the food, and you, you could only enter alone. And you entered alone, you looked around this room, there was no way out and then quietly this door opened and you could go in. But those that terms of engagement, 
again, the phrase I just used a minute ago, but the terms of engagement with which you entered that space then determined how you wandered around. You weren't with your mate, you weren't judging. You were curious. You weren't going, oh, this is good, this is bad, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to You weren't doing any of that, because you didn't have your mate with you. You were on your own. And you were just in an environment totally, your whole body was an environment. So you were reacting with your body, and you were kind of too busy to judge, too busy to apply your preconceptions. Um, so I learned a lot from that. Um, and so did Felix. So Felix founded Punch Drunk based on that room. And all of the installation artworks that I've made have started, more or less, many of them um, have started with a room just like the one you went into, uh, a room where your terms of engagement are established as an audience, where you sit, you watch, and then something happens to the film which splits it apart. The first one had a hole in it, it's in the book, it's called Mirror Maze, it had a hole in the film, literally, and you walk through it. The second one in 2017 had the person just like upstairs pulling a little string, open the door. Um, and Super Blue in Miami has a little door that opens in it. Um, and I guess, yeah, I've always felt that about films. When people say to me, why don't you do films? I'm very interested in what a film is projected on. I mean, to me, this surface, you know, there's a screen. I can't quite get beyond that. I don't want to pretend it's not there. I want to engage with the materiality. There's bodies in the room. There's a screen surface. Yes, there's a film on it, which is magical. It's an illusion. But can we also engage ourselves in you know, the surface, cut a hole in it, walk through it? Um, so that's what I wanted to do for the beginning of this exhibition. Also, I was really aware that this exhibition is hopefully going to introduce a lot of people to the practice who, who won't have a clue what I do. So it's really important. It's quite, a, you know, actually, sidebar story. Because people often, when I get in a situation, I walk into a room, and people say, so what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I um, uh, so now I've got this book in my bag, and I just say, have a look at that. And it's really relaxing. So, so the reason why I wanted to do the film also is if you just turned up, you go, yeah, but what did this person do? You'd be able to just hopefully hopefully get a sense of it. Um, so that's what the film is for. Well, but I also, there's something about the experience of being in that room. You know, and you're with a group of strangers that you don't know, and you're all there to encounter this experience. And it builds and crescendos, and what we were experiencing last night was a range of reactions that audiences would gasp when the, when the wall opened. There were some that erupted in applause <laughs> at the end of it. So there is, I, I think that you're also just doing something incredibly special by bringing people together in that way. I, I think that's true. You know, the little group that you go in with, that's your, that's yeah. your group, and then you yeah. go, it's, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, also to invite people into my studio. And something actually we haven't touched on much, but it'd be nice to, is we've got a plan. So if any of you teach or are part of anyone who knows anyone who goes to a school around here or not around here or anywhere, we've got a bit of a plan for the program where we want to, the wall that gets projected on the studio, we want to be able to make that portal to my studio in London. So a group could come, sit around the table, and they would look through, and I'd be in my studio in London on my studio team, whatever meetings we're doing, and be able to just do an exchange. Um, because we're here till August. Yeah. So we really want to make sure this is reaching out to as many you know, practitioners, students, kids, whatever. Well, and I love that idea of, of just bringing other people into the practice and giving them access. You know, and just creative collaboration itself is so important to you, and even just the way that you designed the opening apertures of the book with, again, that whole, there's like this interrogation <laughs> of materiality itself. And you do the same thing also in the exhibition with the iris. You know, you're really using these apertures, these circles, to represent these overlaid perspectives or layers of your collaborators. So talk a little bit to us about that act of collaboration, whether it's with an audience or with a director or a performer, and how you maintain the integrity of an idea. Well, that was really important in the book and in Upstairs as well. 
the work that I make is made by so many people. I mean, a lot of people. Even the small stuff. Even our exhibitions made by a lot of people. Yeah. You know, and what people give to make this work, I cannot tell you. Whether it's in the artwork that we make, the theatre work, the fashion work, the pop music work, the lives that are devoted to it. I mean, I mean, Yvonne. Can we talk about Yvonne? Uh, yes, I just Yvonne need to celebrate Yvonne. Yvonne, yeah, she's Yvonne is our, um, yeah. one of our um, production team upstairs. And, you know, there was something that needed to be restitched and we oh, didn't have a sewing machine. Yeah. She literally sat on the floor the night before the opening, got her little sewing yeah. kit out. You know, she had barely slept. She just, but that's, that is really typical of people who work. Because once you're all collaborating on getting a thing made, and I guess the difference between a sort of a practice that you know might be generating things when they're ready with this once you've made a plan to do a show whether it's a gallery show whether it's a theater show the audience are coming that's the one thing you probably won't change they're going to come on that day at that time so that becomes a really key collaborator with everybody else is you know they're coming and you're thrilled they're coming because it means you're going to stop work you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> if they didn't come, you'd be bloody going forever, you know. So it, it, it really is helpful to know that they're coming. And, and often, you know, that's the only we, way we know our work is done. It's because the audience have come. So it's time. Um, and that ritual, that sense of ritual, that there is a, an agreement with the audience. And often in theatre, you know, the more that budgets got cut in British theatre, the tighter our time schedules became. And we often had to open a show really when we hadn't finished doing the lighting, nothing was quite ready, but we made a contract with the audience. They had bought a ticket, they had arranged their evening, they're gonna come. So we really, only in a disaster would you cancel. You know, they come. Um, which is why when things do get canceled, it's not great. Um, but yeah, so I'd say collaboration then, the lives that are devoted, it's really important that those people get celebrated. Um, so that's why the book starts with a, a, a kind of invocation, and I read their names upstairs. Actually, light designer Jason Bowe was a bit freaked out. He walked up there and he heard his name <laughs> being read out. Um, so their names are being read, they're being invoked, they're being thanked for being part of this. Um, and also, I wanted to talk about what it means to collaborate. There's a few things going on there. A lot of people who work with the intensity that we work are there's, there's reasons why we choose this path. I mean, any of you are here who work all night and you know, devote yourselves. I mean, you can unpick your own personal reasons for why you're doing it, but often it's a way of finding a new family. Um, it's a way of having quite intense relationships through your work, you know, those choices are being made. Like someone asked me yesterday, you know, what, what was, which piece has been the most fun? And I could only quote Noel Coward who says, work is more fun than fun. Because I, I can't remember when I had fun. But I had fun this morning. But, but generally, I, I find work is more fun than fun. And that's true probably of a lot of the people who, who work on these things. So what the overlapping voids and apertures mean is a number of things. At once, they're talking about overlapping perspectives. There is just this chink of Venn diagram where my perspective, the perspective of the engineer, the director, the musician, the recording artist, just about overlap just about, sometimes you have to squint to find it. So there's that piece, but there's also all of our needs. The best work is made because it was needed to be made. And I'm not saying it's, it comes from a pain or a loss or a void, but it comes from some kind of drive, doesn't it? It comes from somewhere, it comes from seeking, a seeking, a, a, a telescope, a magnifying glass, a seeking, a curiosity. Um, and there was a wonderful interview with Mark Rylance, the director, uh, sorry, the actor director, and so the interviewer was asking him, how do you cope with the death of your stepdaughter who tragically died? Do you fill the void with art? And he said, no, you can't fill a void with art, but you can garden, plant around its edges. You can embroider around the void, or the loss, or the pain, whatever it is. And there's a sense of that, I think, in those. I sort of wrote in the front of the book, I tried to fill a void with art, but actually what I was doing was not that. I was encircling it. And that's sort of what that open piece is about. So this almost 30 year practice that you've been telling us about and sharing stories with us, what does it mean at this point to now 
take a moment to look back at it through the creation of the book, through the exhibition upstairs. What has that done for you and for your practice at this moment? I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad it's done. <laughs> I have, my children and my husband were there. They said, oh, is the book done yet? Because literally the writing of the book, because I don't normally write. I write a little bit, I like writing, but to write, and I really wanted each word to be valuable and to be worthwhile, and I wanted to try and trace not just my 30 year period. I didn't think it was really that relevant to just write what I've done. I thought it was more interesting if I could somehow thread what has happened over 30 years in my town, in my country, a little bit in the world, how we've all gone on a journey in 30 years. And yet I could only write about it from my own very personal perspective. Um, so I could only write my own story, but I wanted to try to draw those threads in. Um, and there was an interesting examples. For example, in 2005, I did a production of a play called Hecuba, Euripides, Greek tragedy, which had been written by Euripides um, centuries and centuries ago to really, as a warning against war, they had just come out of a period of uh, of wars that had been devastating. And it was a way to, the earliest forms of Greek theater were really a way to help an audience feel what it would feel like. That's what it was for. It was for empathy, it was, that's what it was for. So when Hecuba cries over her lost son, the audience, it's particularly designed to make the audience feel what it will be like if they lose their son, and to encourage them to not want to go to war. That was the point, that's why he was writing those. And of course, there was, it wasn't by chance that we were doing Hecuba with Vanessa Redgrave, who's a massive pacifist, activist, anti-war. We were all demonstrating on the streets in the, in the throes and in the wake of the Iraq wars, the ongoing Iraq wars, which were still ongoing in 2003, 2004, obviously. And five productions, it turns out, when I was Googling it, researching it for the book, there were five productions of Hecuba in and around the UK. I didn't realize that at the time, but a lot of us were doing that play because we were trying to understand that moment in time, the dissonance of being in a country that we called our country, but that was doing something we really didn't believe in. I mean, the march against the Iraq war and the disillusion with that, that great hope we'd had of the new Labour government. And we were so disillusioned that they were suddenly not with us. And I mean, everybody went on that march. It was the hugest march that ever happened. I remember going on the march here because, um, Hecuba came to Washington, that play. And then we, the, the writer, Tony Harrison, the poet who'd done the translation of it, we had done quite an abstract version in London. When we came here, he said, come, we have to just go in and do something different. So we made, it's in the book, this concentric circles, like an Epidaurus kind of Greek theater of army tents. But we went to army surplus shops in, uh, in Virginia. And they all had sand in them. And we made this thing of them. And it was very immediate, very immediate. So I wanted to try and find those threads. And I, to be honest with you, I never would have, I didn't know what my practice was as a whole. When I went the final room, which is very much the work of Maria Nicanor, who's sick of me telling the story, but it is the case, because <laughs> uh, it came together quite late when we realized we didn't perhaps have too many copies of the book available. So we decided to paste it all around the wall of the final room. But for me, it's very emotional to see the book all unfolded like that. Because it wasn't until I made the book and the exhibition that I had seen my practice all together. Things had happened in time. They'd happened sort of written in sand, washed over the next day, pieces gone back into inventory. All of those bits of truss and lighting, they went back to the warehouse, the bits of wood went on to be other things. Everything is in flow and in flux. So to have them all crystallized beats all together, it's the first time I've seen my practice and I wanted to show it to everybody like that. It's quite, it's quite medicinal. <laughs> Makes me feel less fragmented. Where do you see your practice heading in the future? Well, I think this is a good moment at the slides. Um, I would like to do those drawings. Um, these were the ones of the Nevada species in the sphere, but the first ones of the London species. It came about when asked to do a piece about London. Um, I asked the London Wildlife Trust what would be the best thing to do, and they said, well, there's 15,000 species of Londoners, and only one is human. And if you can make a habitat for some of these endangered species in the human imagination, you'll be doing the best that an artist or a designer can do 
for the problem of extinction of, the spe of species, because we can deal with all sorts of other habitats, but the human imagination needs rooms in it with the names of these animals, because if we don't have a habitat in our human imagination, there isn't much hope for it in the wider planet. So I would like to draw the species of New York, I'm just manifesting it, <laughs> um, and make a big, beautiful dome in Central Park. I'm hoping that might happen, hopefully before this ends, we never know, or after. Um, because I spent four months making these drawings uh, of individual species, and I, I learned so much. I learned about my own physiognomy. I learned you know, that my hand relates to the, the knuckles, relate to the knuckles on a bird's wing, that the veins relate to the veins in a bat's wing. I felt so, I felt continuous. I had read a lot about the philosophy of continuity of self from a human into the biosphere, from humans into every other human. I'd read about it. But it took practice. I had to practice it to learn it and to really feel it. And these, you know, four months of drawing every day um, really helped me feel that. And that's what I'd like to continue to do and probably write a bit more about it as well. Um, I think that will be the focus of the practice moving forward. Well, we would all read your words and come look at any of that. So I want to open it up to questions from all of you. Who's going to kick us off? We have one right BJ. here. BJ. All right. I met BJ upstairs, and I said, please have a great question. Thank you, BJ. <laughs> I asked some of you, some other people to get good questions. I hope you've, yeah. You, yeah. Sorry, BJ. What's your question? <laughs> Don't give him the dud mic. Yeah. Hello. Hey, BJ. Hi. Thank you for an incredible exhibition and for this talk and for sharing this time with us. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions about your studio. Um, about magic, nature, architecture, but if I have one question, I'm curious about trust in your practice, because you do collaborate with some, such a wide variety of people, and you tend to do work that, of course, is somewhat unconventional within the fields that you're practicing. How do you develop that trust so that you can say, I'm going to break the rules here, and you know, six months from now, or however many years from now, this work is going to be um, worth your trust in me as a designer and, um, yeah. Well, a really good question. And your other two unasked questions were also good about magic, the studio, and trust. Um, and what there's trust, obviously, in both directions. In all three, right? There's trust in my studio, my studio trusting me, all of us trusting magic, and the people who pay for it trusting us not to fuck it up. Right? I think that's what you're asking. Um, so, the last piece, which was the one you prioritized, I'll answer first. Um, everything is a prototype. There's a phrase that I'm slightly misquoting from T.S. Eliot, um, always finding words for things we no longer need to say. So if we've worked out how to do it, then we don't want to do it anymore, because we've done it. So everything is a prototype. And there's a, a really... Um, uh, explicit example, a concrete example of that, which I'll describe to you, because I think it's more interesting if I give you concrete examples. Um, the, the first concert that Adele did after taking five years away from making music, or making music but not being in the public eye, was at Radio City Music Hall in this city. And I went in there and I thought it'd be really interesting to project over the whole shell, the whole beautiful surface of that theater and then just cut a hole in the projection and have her in there. So I said, let's do that. And it was for a one night only show. I think we had an overnight to set it up. And everybody in the building said, absolutely not. Absolutely not, this will not work. The union thingy won't, uh, anyway, that wouldn't work. And also, um, it just won't show on camera. It's gonna cost a lot of money and it won't work. And I said, yeah, but can we still do it? Because <laughs> I have a feeling it will work. They said, that what you've got? I said, yeah. I think it will work. Based on my experience, based on things I have done, I think if you put a ton of projectors up there, it will be awesome, and we should do it, and it's the best thing to do. So, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And then I, I remember, I always remember, I don't know if any of you like this, I always remember phone conversations by what I'm looking at when the phone call comes, because I think we're all synesthetic, we probably all do that. But it was really cold, I was at a dinner, in Bregenz, actually, because we were busy working on the next opera, um, uh, the uh, Carmen on the lake in Bregenz, the big hands coming up the lake. And I'm in this little restaurant, it's really cold, and uh, it's noisy in the restaurant, and I get the call from 
Adele's manager. And I'm like, oh, well, this is the call. I've got to convince him to get the project. So I step out, and it's freezing. I'm wearing just a little T-shirt. It's freezing, it's snowing, and I'm looking at the nice sparkling lights inside this restaurant. He goes, right, so, you know, everyone's saying this won't work. It's going to cost, you know, half a million pounds. It's not going to work. Why do you want to do it? And I said, because I think it will work. He said, can you guarantee it? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> it's never been done, so I can't guarantee it. When will we know if it works? I said, on the day. <laughs> he said, but you really want it? I said, I really think we should do it. Okay, so we did it. And, of course, from that, every show has projection. Now all the Rockette shows has projection, and there's the sphere, which is basically a version of that. But that was trust. He trusted me. Um, so that's that one. Um, <laughs> magic. I just have to tell... Can I tell my magic story? Yeah. This yeah, is a good, good. story. Um, so there's a sleight of hand magician, and he's called David Abram, and he's also an eco-philosopher, geo-philosopher. And one day, he is doing coin and card tricks at a restaurant in Massachusetts. And the owner of the restaurant gets quite a lot of complaints over the, over the weeks, and he eventually comes and says, look, five different people have complained. And they've said that you must be spiking their drinks. Because when they leave the restaurant, the, the sky is a really vivid blue, really vivid. And the cracks in the pavement are really kind of dancing around in an interesting way. So, I mean, I wouldn't have come to you with this, but five different people have complained, you know. And David Abrams says, when you destabilize people's expectations about how coins and cards behave, then you destabilize their expectation about how blue the sky might be and about how interesting the cracks in the pavement might be. And they don't look anymore with their preconceived idea of what the blue is going to be. They actually look. And when you really look with your senses instead of with your judgment and your preconceptions, then the sky is bluer than you thought. So magic's really important and trusting magic. And for me, magic becomes technology. Because whenever I use technology, I never go, oh, I want to use that new AI thing. I just go, how can I make this magic? And someone who knows how to use the technology says, well, I know how to do that. Um, and then the last piece about trusting the studio and the studio trusting me, that's a really important piece. Um, so in our studio, which you wanted to ask about, so I'll ask the question myself. Um, the, in the studio, there are six of us. And it's in my front room at the moment. It's about to move out, but it's very small. And obviously, we work with lots of people beyond. I just made a point to never say obviously again, because it sounded so crap. I'm not going to say obviously anymore. Scribe the obviously. They work in my room, and there are a lot of other people working on the other projects. Um, but they have to... I, I, I'm very conscious that they give every day to me, to the, to the practice. They come in, so I really need to make it worth their while. I'm really conscious of making each day worth their while. And we... We also are very conscious of, we can't account for every emission, carbon emission of all the projects we do yet, but we can account for our own emissions. So each day they come into the studio, for every person as they work in the studio, two trees are planted every day. And there are eight girls that are um, every day given skills training in Malawi, and 46 girls a year are fed clothes and um, educated in a boarding house that we built. So we are really engaged with trying to mitigate the emissions of our own studio. We've done quite a lot of calculation with the flights, me being here, um, the heating, all of that stuff. And we are vegetarian meals every day. So we try and make it a place where when they come to work, they're not just being part of what we make, but they're being part of a practice that is really trying to account for itself and add a budget of carbon, as well as all the other budgets we worked together on. Um, there's a million other things to say about the studio, but that's a piece of trust between us. Yeah, I see another question back here. Um, okay. Hi. Um, we can hear you oh, fine. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. We need the mic. She needs to speak for the caption. Oh, for the video. Okay. Um, hi. Oh, she got the mic. Hi, how are you? What's your name? Uh, Yvonne, actually. Hey, Yvonne. Yes. Don't worry. What's your name? Other girl. What's your name? Rob, so you're going to get it after this one. So Yvonne's going to pass it to you. Yvonne, go for it. All right, um, I like your style. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this lecture. I was really inspired. And I was really curious about your experience uh, between transitioning from a designer for other people's stories and text into 
I would say, like curator or creator of your own original ideas and text, and how did you find that experience or transition? Um, it, like, do you find it difficult, or do you find it more like this is what you want to do? Uh, things like that. Yeah. That's a really good question, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Um, I think, in a way, I've, I've been telling my own stories a bit through elision with other people's stories, always. Um, but when I was probably at a stage where I could have just said, right, I'm going to go to art school and I'm just going to paint and make my own stories or make my own sculptures, I didn't feel I had enough to say. Rightly or wrongly, I don't know. But I was faced with a really clear choice. There was a white room that was empty, and that was... I had done so much education. I'd done my English degree. I'd done a now a you know foundational art course. I had done this two-year postgrad. In th uh, well, I'd done the art course, and there was a choice to go and do another four-year degree and just make art. And I, I looked at that white room, and I, I looked at the people around me who were going to be in the other white rooms, and they were so sure of what they wanted to say. And I just wasn't. And I didn't feel that the materials that I would be using would be used in a valid way. I didn't feel I had enough. I thought I'd be mustering up things to say somehow. And I was just still wanting to learn, still wanting to be curious. Um, and I guess through now having learned by being every day in what I do, I consider an education. I'm reading every day, I'm meeting people every day. I feel like now, now I feel ready to say something. Only now, but I didn't, I didn't want to say it before I had something you know, I'd mustered it up. It took time. So I didn't want to just, you know, say I'm an artist, I'm going to say something. I wasn't ready. Um, but the transition now, which actually began in 2016, really became, I think, because of the reading I had done. I had read uh, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, in 2013. And I felt the urgency of the time, I guess, as well. I felt the urgency of the climate crisis, the civilizational crisis, which are absolutely entangled with the climate crisis. I just had learned enough. And then I felt the urgency, well, I need to say something. It's great to do these plays. It's great to do these concerts. It's, this is all great. But actually, the resources that are going into them, I, I must use these resources for this purpose. So I felt driven, I guess, at that point. And the transition, to answer your point directly, um, has been, I haven't found it hard. It's, it seemed quite natural, actually. And I've felt a lot of support from audiences such as yourselves who have been supportive of, of me making that transition. Thanks for the question, great question. Robs, is it Robs? Yes. Hi. Hello. OK, so um, thank you so much for sharing your time and your words and your thoughts. It's been really lovely to hear everything. Um, I'm wondering, especially early in your career, how no and failure factored into your process and into your practice, and how that's been incorporated into your work. These are such great questions, <laughs> top questions. Um, really lovely question, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I made a lot of really crap work. <laughs> really crap. I just didn't put it upstairs, it's not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of rubbish. I mean, I've made a lot of work, and some of it was really not good. Um, so you just have to go out there and make some crap stuff. And, and the great thing about, you know, everything we're talking about, the joy of collective experience, we all know that when theatre is bad, my God, is it bad. <laughs> And when you sit through your own work with your own friends and family and it's just cringe making me bad, and then at the end you come out and no one wants to look at each other because it's so crap. <laughs> or they say the set was good, and you're like, well, yeah, the rest of it was crap, or, you know, that didn't really work. Um, you know, it, it's, it's unforgettable when things are bad. And it, and it burns into your soul, and you never want to feel like that again. So it's a really great driver to try and learn from the mistake, you d I don't want to. I don't want to feel like that again, because there's a real responsibility in each piece. It's not just a work for you if it's crap you just put it on the floor. No, you've spent people's money, and you've spent people's time. You've invited them all, and the more I go on in my career, the more people think, "Oh, it might be good. She's done it." And if it's crap, I say, like, "Shit, I didn't. It was rubbish." And that that happens now. It happened then, um, but you you will never. Just back to the other point about you know prototypes. If you only make what you know will work, then you will never grow and you won't grow the, 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 the form. So you just have to know that there will be some crap stuff and people will forgive you for it. They will forgive you for it. Because as long as you were endeavoring to do something new, and that, 
you know, I had to deal with that all that. I, mean, I used to be completely, I would be weeping for days when I got a review that says there's Devlin's clunky set, you know, da, da, da. I mean, it would crucify me at the beginning. It was devastating, humiliating, you know. Um, but gradually you just develop, you become quite tough. <laughs> you have to be quite tough. Um, so you just get, you, and you know that really, if, as long as you are moving forward, as long as you are trying to grow, learn, share your learning, help the community to grow, if you're doing that truthfully, honestly, with a good heart and a good intention, it doesn't really matter if you fail along the way. And people, your community around you, that's the most important thing is to have a community around you who will be honest. Say, so, well, that one's a bit shit, but this bit was good. I mean, even the other night, we were out with Dennis, who came all the way to see a piece of work that was a bit crap. And he said, well, there was one good moment in it. It was worth, <laughs> it was worth the journey for that. And, you know, we still make rubbish work now. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got a question right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tabitha. Hi, Tabitha. Lovely to meet you. Um, you said a lot of great things tonight, and what resonated with me the most was that you put meaning into every little thing that you do. Um, so as another creative, I just wanted to ask, what gives that inspiration for you every single day? Because you mentioned that you have a family, and I'm sure you have a very busy schedule, so how do you balance that and also inspire you to do something that's amazing that you do all the time? That's a really good question, Tabitha, thank you. Um, well, the family, because I've got a 16-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy, and they love to tell me when it's rubbish. <laughs> you know, they just say, oh, mum, you can't do that, it's terrible. You know, you know, they love that. And they also say when things, they think things are good. So, and also, so I, I see things through their perspective. And they also bring references. There's a lot of artists, musicians that I'm not aware of. They can come to me and say, this is a really interesting artist. You should listen to this. Um, so I intertwine. I mean, in the way that I say work is more fun than fun, my children are complicit in the practice. They come in and out of the studio. Um, but, but also in terms of finding inspiration, finding, it, it, it is always about looking for meaning. Um, and there's also a, a, a sense of responsibility to the materials, because the stuff that I make is generally, because of the nature of it being public, because it wants to be expansive and to in, invite an audience in, it's generally using quite a lot of materials. So more and more, I, I just, I feel a responsibility if I'm gonna use that piece of wood or that piece of mirror, whatever it is, it has to be saying something, you know. Otherwise, I feel guilty. I just feel, why did I waste that time, those people's time? More people, and as, as I progress and there's more and more people coming, you know, I feel really responsible. Um, but I never, I never let it overwhelm me because I always know that as long as I'm curious, then the people coming will also be curious and it'll be worthwhile. So I have a process that I really trust, which is just to, even really late, in process, even like with us finishing this exhibition, never, never be in a panic about having to get something finished. Take the step back. If you're rushing to get something finished, take the step back and go, what does it actually mean? And is it worth it? The thing we're all rushing to finish, if, there's a, if it isn't quite gelling and isn't quite finished yet, maybe it wasn't the right idea. And it's never too late. Never too late in a process because it'd be better to have a sketch of the right idea than a really finished, tightly done thing of an idea that wasn't actually right. And you might, actually Lindsay, another, you know, she articulates things so well, she says, everybody collides with the work at a different time in a collaboration. The collision with the work, knowing what it is. So a director, a designer, if you work in a, as a creative, or any of your creative collaborators, there's a moment at which they go, oh, I know what we're making. Up until that point, they go, well, I'm doing my bit, my bit, my bit, my bit. I said, oh, I know what we're making now. And that moment of collision with the work, the thing that's going to be there, and even upstairs, there was a different moment where everybody goes, like, Matilda's, like, oh, I know what you're making. You know, you know but you, I know what, and it's useful that people come at different times. It's really useful, because while people are deep in the weeds of it, there's someone who just floats and says, oh, I know, I know what it is. So to really trust that different moment of collision with the work, and I'd say, I'm not, what area do you work in, Tabitha? Uh, Ob. Plain to see. Evident from the 1630s. Ob, the Yeah, yeah. Plain to see. Evident. Kind of boring. I'll, just I'll, boring. I'll, I'll find out later why I don't like it. Yeah. Maybe it's just the way it sounds. So we have time for one last question. 
before I saw this hand up first, right here in front. Hello. Hi. I'm Bella. Thanks nice so to meet you, Bella. For, Thanks for asking a question. Of course. Uh, thank you for being here and for having such a brilliant talk. Um, so I'm so in awe of how sure you are in your decisions and in your designs. For example, the Adele entire set sign. You said, I know that's going to work. I feel it. When you were younger, specifically when you're in theater school training for set design, how did you develop that trust in yourself and that intuition? Or take that first leap and say, hey, I'm going to go with this idea. These are such good questions. It's picking up on BJ's point about trust. Um, I mean, I very, I'll just tell you a tiny story which might be to the point. I very confidently walk out of any building and turn with absolute confidence in the wrong direction. <laughs> Every time. And my, my family laugh at me because I'm, I'm never in any doubt. Is anyone else like that? I think it's not that. I, I have absolute confidence and, you know, and that's a dangerous thing because I might lead a lot of people with me in the wrong direction. But I guess um, I wasn't always like that at all. I, I tried to be truthful. I tried to draw, I, and I drew on things. You know, I, I made decisions based on what I'd read, based on, and I, and I learned a lot from people. I mean, that's the nature. If you work in theatre and you work with directors, you work with lighting designs, you work with, you, if you, you know, I watched my little daughter pick up things and I was just, it, I was just, I was picking up everything. I was learning, 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 copying. Copy, 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 copy. There is no shame in copying. I was copying everyone. I was like, oh, that's, I'm gonna say that next time. Yeah. Oh, that, that, but that, but I'm gonna do that. So I learned, learned, learned. And I, and I exposed, I mean, the thing when I say upstairs, every time I reach a fork in the road, I take both paths and then take both again at the next division. The more I divide and multiply, the more I offer myself to the air. I was just, I realized later that a gas exchange device bifurcates many times to expand its surface area so it can be good at exchanging gases. And I was just, as a human doing that, I was just trying to open myself to as much influence as possible. And I think I'd been doing it since I was very young. I'd been trying to put myself in situations and just absorb, absorb, absorb. And I think that's the way to build. I mean, I wouldn't say I was certain. When I said that thing to Adele's manager, I wasn't certain. I was certain that I wanted it to happen. I, was, I could see it in my mind's eye and I wanted it to happen. And I had enough experience with bits and pieces I'd done to, to have a good hunch it would work. And that's not unusual. When you work in it, again, you, and you, you don't do any of this alone. You know, I had a lighting designer, video designer. I said, do you think about, yeah, you know, there's a few people. It wasn't just me. Um, and, and I think that's the other thing. Don't, if ever you're not quite sure, you're not going to be sure. You're not, you're not going to wake up tomorrow and be sure. So don't, don't have a go at yourself not being sure. Just hang out with some people. Ask what they think. Read some books. Do some research. Know that it won't come. It might not be inside. The answer, if you don't know the answer, probably, you're probably not going to know it. You've got to just go and read. Don't, you know... Don't sit there going, why don't I know? Just go and ask some other people, you know, read, read some more things, see some more things, draw some more into you, is my advice. That's what I did. Well, thank you. As, thank you for being here with us tonight.